Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here in New Hampshire. I, um, I am just really excited to be here for a number of reasons, and I hope today that I'm able to um, entertain you a little bit, provoke your thinking, and validate some of um, what's going on here. Um, I, I, I was wondering this morning how many um, tech people it takes to get a show up and running and how quickly it could happen. <laughs> and I realized that um, it's not just you know, a few people that it takes to really help educate and make things work. Here, the, the troops came in to help out here um, and make the program go. I, <laughs> I was able to capture this while I was sitting there, and my point is that um, it, it really takes a lot of people working together to make education happen. Um, I, I'm a very serious believer that it is um, the school as a place with brick and mortar and people is going to be something that we are going to need in the future and will continue to provide value in our future. Um, and I'll talk some more about that. When I came, um, when I learned about that I was coming to New Hampshire, I did some reading up on the programs that you have here, um, and I was extraordinarily impressed with some of the things I saw, such as the Innovation Hub, your Next Generations um, uh, programs that your Department of Education are um, working on. I, I looked into a foundation that's actually helping you develop those initiatives, um, the Stupsky Foundation, and what a progressive great organization they are. And um, one thing that I really thought was the most interesting about New Hampshire is your commitment to one, personalized learning, and also your commitment to competency-based graduation. In fact, um, although you are just a little state up here, I found myself bragging about you often in my conversations throughout the past few months. Um, where people would be talking about graduation requirements and what's going to happen um, in the future of education. And I, I kept rolling off my tongue, well, guess what New Hampshire's doing? And some people knew what, what you're doing. And so we were able to you know, fist bump over New Hampshire that we, we were uh, in the know about what was going on. Um, I, I work now at an independent school in Wilson, Arkansas, in a town of 900 people. That said, um, our school is a private school with a public purpose. Uh, most of the kids who go to the school um, are on financial aid, 100% uh, financial aid, and a lot of the kids, uh, and nobody pays over 50% of the cost of education. I'm saying that because I want this audience to know that I am very much a public school advocate. Um, our school doesn't take money away from the public schools in order to run. Um, I, um, but in, I'm in an independent school because the opportunity made itself available to me and because I'm a real innovator and I, um, I find myself moving around a lot in order to help ideas and express um, curriculum for people. So one thing that I noticed and everywhere I was working and teaching is that we have this notion of how education should progress. And it's almost like there's this linear line and um, we have all of these benchmarks that we have to make in order to be a, a good student. Um, you know, straight A's, are they in a number of extracurricular activities, have they taken AP classes, what's their rank, what's their SAT score, and did they get into a top college? And these seem to be the benchmarks by which we judge whether or not we're doing a good job helping kids succeed. Um, I find that curious and um, I find that line, like if that were a line, say, in a um, uh, how, and if you were in the hospital and that was your line, you would be dead. So um, I feel like our c continued desire to have our kids just follow that linear line is really part of what's killing education. But I also feel like this is sort of what is killing our education as well. Um, 
I, I, I've driven around, I'm sure you've seen this, where the bumper sticker or the, the bumper stickers on people's cars are kind of like mini scoreboards. They, they tell what, uh, where a parent feels like they've been successful in raising their kid. And I always found this really curious. And um, I find it curious because what kids want for themselves and their lives and what parents want for their kids seem to be really at odds with one another. And I, I always think that when we want, uh, when we impose what the parents want for their kids on the kids' lives, what you get are a lot of kids who are feeling really uncomfortable about school, they're feeling insecure about school, they're feeling as though um, school's not for them, it's for pleasing someone else. And that's where I think we begin to lose kids. Now, we can talk about kids being bored and that be boredom is um, a number one problem and so we gotta ex make education more exciting. But I think it really goes back to the purposes of education. Uh, let me ask, if, how many people in the room are math teachers? Okay, so you can't participate in the next question. So if you are um, not a math teacher, how many people know what this is? Raise your hand. Okay, so it's the, what, what, what equation is this? Okay, math teacher, help out. It's a quadratic equation, a parabola. Actually, it's mapping the quadratic equation as well. What is a quadratic equation? How many people learned that in high school? Like, we all did, right? How many people who aren't math teachers use, can, can, can say what it is, can recite it? Okay, so we all learned it, but if you look around, nobody really can recite it. Well, no one's gonna volunteer, they're for free, I'm gonna call you and you'll get it wrong. But, and then the next question is, so if, so if you don't even know it, how many people would use this every day in their jobs? I would venture to say that there are many of us who have learned so many things. How many people took more than two years of foreign language? Okay, how many people can speak fluently or speak or really confidently still in that foreign language? Fewer and fewer. Um, so what I think is that um, we teach a lot of things that we believe are really necessary for someone to be educated, and yet what we find out is that kids really don't actually remember and, re and re retain all of this information. We know that, but the question that I have is, is how important is it to success in life? Some of it's gonna be, but it's gonna be based individually on each person, what they use and what they find success to, to help them be successful in life. So how many of you, um, you know, I always have people ask me about, well, the SAT, because that's gonna be the gatekeeper for getting into college. And the uh, um, amount of value that people place on the SAT score, we're educators, so we know the gig, we know it's not you know, where it's at in education. But I always ask parents this question, what is your spouse's SAT score? So how many of you know your spouse's SAT score? <laughs> Some of you, that your hands go up is so funny to me. How many of you who know it have a higher SAT score than their spouse? Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> worth knowing. <laughs> so, um, you know, it doesn't, these indicators of success don't always really matter in our future. So the question that we should be asking is, what does matter? Um, does, who knows what this is? Yes, Sputnik, all right? So I would say that this invention is the single most uh, technological advance responsible for what I call the fear-based model of education. So that model with the, uh, with the parents and the um, bumper stickers uh, and, the, and the gap between what kids want and what parents want, what fills that gap is usually fear. And it's a big fear. And this particular fear um, happened in, you know, in the 80s and then a, a report followed that I think we're all still sort of grappling with, and the report was the nation at risk. And the nation at risk had many, many statements, but one of them is that our nation is at risk 
The educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation and people. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might have well viewed it as an act of war. We have, in effect, been committing an act of unthinking unilateral educational disarmament. So these are fearful terms. These are war terms. These are the terms that I believe led to this. Um, and while a nation at risk had a lot of different uh, suggestions um, for improvement, and some of those suggestions were, were fabulous, like that professionals would be paid at a professional rate, that uh, schools would support uh, learning in real life experience. It seems to be that the takeaways were really focused on textbooks and standardization. Now I can go into a lot of reasons why I believe that's true. I think sometimes initiatives follow somebody's profit stream. Unfortunately, it's not ours. And unfortunately, it's not the kids. So um, you know, this led to a lot of things, uh, the No Child Left Behind, which I think we're all still kind of in the rubble of. Um, but I think Nation at Risk, then when it picked up a No Child Left Behind, um, we, we've had some backlash and some protest because we don't want kids to think this way. You felt handcuffed, all of you, by what this has done to you as a teacher. And um, I think that a lot of things because of this have risen to uh, improve education. So we've had a lot of things like STEM come around and uh, our technology has added to having to change our classroom processes. I was just in a uh, conference in Memphis at, at where I spoke and then I took a break and watched some other people speaking and um, I, um, I remember I had just shown this slide in my other presentation and then I went into a room and um, really the guy was selling biology in a box. And um, so there were, I don't know if you've used that. I mean, I guess people would think it was a, a great tool. It's a little expensive, I'll say that. But you know, my thinking was, well, we're trying to get out of the box. And now here people are selling the whole curriculum in the box. And it's going to be sold as STEM. And I have a real problem with that, because it's fundamentally still not answering the question of what and why we're teaching these kids. So in my opinion, when STEM becomes a way to have activity and hands-on things reinforce the content, you're really not advancing the learning. You're reinforcing the content with a different kind of tool. I would also have to say that blended learning, flipped classrooms, is pretty much the same thing. So we've decided, well, you don't need a teacher up there giving you all the information. That's information you can just get online and the teacher online and disseminate online that the relationship doesn't matter. But 90% of that is still content download. So if you're a human being, a child, and you're getting a lot of download, a lot of download, the questions that they have all the time are, where's the upload? Where are we going to apply this? Um, a lot of talks in education revolve around this concept. Um, when this tool came to into being, all kinds of things changed that we don't need anymore. And you've been through, you've seen these presentations, I'm sure. So it's the watch, and it's the wallet now, and it's the camera, and it's the all of the different places that um, have changed. And then it would be compared to what we're still doing in school. I actually don't believe that. Um, that this is where we're stuck. I think we're beyond this at this point. I think, I know, except there's another disruption coming, and it's coming soon. And the disruption that's coming is going to demand that we actually start asking the real questions of education, which are, why are we educating and what are we educating for? And I would pose this that when we say we're educating because our test scores are lower than other nations, that is not a very good response that a child wants to hear. His or her education is not done on the backs of somebody who wants our test scores to be higher. 
I would also venture to say that the fear about the economy might be there, but a kid doesn't actually really care about that fear. So let me put a little bit of, um, you might know some of these things, but let me put into your uh, tool bag, when you're thinking about why you're educating kids, some things that are going to happen. So this is called the mini version Next 100. It's made by BMW. What this is, is if you've seen, the, there's a little uh, ad. This is a little coop, a mini Cooper, and what it does is when you have separate or different drivers for this car, the car is skinned, meaning that it will change color for the driver getting into the car. Once you're in the car, the car will have a number of metrics that recognize who you are, and it will play the music you like. It will remember where you've gone, uh, where you've driven, and it will um, provide some routes for you. It will remember where you've stopped. So if, if you've stopped a lot at the grocery store and you're out doing something else, it might announce, hey, there's a grocery store on the left, and last week you stopped at 4 o'clock. Uh, you want to stop today, too? So it gets to know you personally. Um, so the, car, the, the phone is going to become the car, in, and this is already on the market. It's being tested. Um, it's in Europe. It's not here. But what this also uh, led me to discover was that um, in the year 2020, which right now it's 17, like that number still sounds really far away, but I have to dial back and think, we're just entering 2017, so 2020 is just around the corner. By that time, we're going to see capabilities um, introduced to consumer cars like we've just seen. We're going to see more and more driverless cars. In 2032, they say that half of the cars shipped to the U.S. will be driverless cars. In 2035, 54 million self-driving cars will be on our roads. Right now, this car is the Google car. This car has been um, driven over 1.7 million miles to date, and it, in 1.7 million miles, it has been involved in 11 accidents only. And of those 11 accidents, they were all caused by humans in other cars and not by uh, the, car, the car or the computer, and, it was, and they've all been in large metropolitan areas. So my point is that the driverless car is coming and that it's going to be a huge disruption. And here's where some of the disruption will be. According to the U.S. Trucker Association, there are 3.5 million truckers in this country. Trucks will be the next thing to be, um, to be human-less drivers. Um, and when people are not um, driving trucks, then they're not stopping at places and commerce along the road where you would stop is not being utilized. So of the 3.5 million truckers, there's an additional 5.2 million people employed who are actually supporting the lifestyle of a trucker going across the country. So they're using things like places to eat, to sleep, to stay. Um, and then they're also in towns where they live, mostly rural is, is what the statistics are on where truckers live. And the towns they're living in, they're bringing back salaries of between forty and $60,000 a year, and they're spending that money in their town. So when you get rid of a trucker who's actually driving the vehicle, it's not just the truck, the driver, it's the salary where they put it, and it's all the support around it that goes away. Um, so that's just one example of, um, of that. Now, I come from a rural community, and in the rural community where I come from, um, we have farmers who are sitting in their tractors uh, harvesting cotton, and they're not doing anything except attending to the GPS, which is really doing all the work for them and telling them where to go, and turning, and, and uh, picking the cotton, and planting the seeds. There's one person, but we are already looking now in my community at what it looks like to have this kind of tractor, which is driverless. There's no place even for somebody to sit in this. This technology isn't coming, it's here. Um, the logarithms would keep the 
tractor on task, and there would be people who would just support looking at the um, at the at the spaces where it's going. Again, these things aren't like some futuristic idea that you would see in um, um, the Jetsons. These are things that are actually in our presence now. So in the same way that these uh, technology advances would disrupt a, um, the economy of the trucker, this agricultural one would disrupt the economies of farmers. They would have to think of something different to do than get in the uh, tractor. Now, I find this really fascinating because I have young students in my school who when you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, they say, I want to be a farmer. My dad's a farmer. I go out with him and do things. And, um, <laughs> You know, we, we puzzle over what that means. What is that going to mean for the future? We, and we really don't have an idea. Now, a lot of you might think, well, that's really why we gotta educate kids. Because if you can really get advanced and get a, you know, most of these jobs and most of these robots are, are for these lower end of the pyramid uh, um, kinds of jobs. So if we really educate up the pyramid, if we really get people advanced enough, then they'll be able to get these higher end jobs and they'll be put to work and, and um, all of that. So, you know, we're, we're thinking if they could just become a doctor, an engineer, uh, an IT manager, a banker, a journalist, then they would be high skilled and make, uh, make money. And so that's probably what parents are going to be looking to us as schools to do. Hey, get my kid at the top of that pyramid, that's your job. But I would venture to say that um, the top of the pyramid is just as much as a, a, a threat for not having jobs as the lower end. So high-skilled jobs like accountants, attorneys, even the creative mindset where we have writers, musicians, and artists. Um, how many of you used, uh, how many of you file your taxes online using software that you've purchased? And then actually you can keep that because it just stores in your computer or uh, in a cloud and they keep it for you. Tax, um, the IRS over the past 20 years has reduced its workforce by, um, by millions of people, 48 million electronic tax returns were filed last year. Um, so you, you're, not, you're not likely to find as many people um, working in accounting jobs as in the future because a lot of that will be taken care of. Attorney jobs, a great deal of time that attorneys spend when they're not in the courtroom arguing is preparing documents. Well, they've assessed that that um, company Legal Docs, have you seen that? Um, that the legal, do the legal document uh, industry has displaced more attorneys than, um, than you can imagine. So those probably aren't necessarily the jobs that people are going to be seeking. There will be fewer and fewer of those jobs as well. Um, so, you know, what does that leave us? Well, I really wanted my son to be a doctor, my daughter to be a doctor is what I hear a lot. Um, but the hospital is a place where many jobs are becoming um, uh, robotic. I have a new hip, I got it in June, and um, they had uh, two doctors in the room and they, it looked like a maker space actually when they rolled me in there, they had a table with saws and hammers and all this stuff and then this thing in the corner and I said, what's that? And they said, that's a, uh, that's a robot that's going to help us drill into your femur. And I thought, well, okay, that's great. But um, so. We have doctors, uh, precision doctors, working um, as robots. Beyond that, though, we also have like this. These are these. Can you see that very well? Okay, so this is a robo doc. It's called. He. This is one doctor who could be sitting in a conference in Switzerland, and in the morning before he goes to work, he's going to buy a computer, check on several of his patients get all of their feedback on their um, blood pressure, their temperature, all, all those things, and then make recommendations or greet them all in mass. So quickly, do it would take him like 30 minutes to go through all his patient load, and then the robo doc would go around and he'd talk to them all individually um, in the hospital. 
So that, that's something that's already happened. So this right here is really fascinating. Um, it's a little paragraph about uh, Friona. Friona fell eight to 10 to Boys Ranch in five innings. It's a sports thing. Uh, this, who, this is written by a computer. So computers are now starting to write. They say computers write over half of the Wikipedia entries. The places that computers are able to pretty accurately and easily write is in news report or in sports reporting because it's, it's pretty standard. They can get good um, information for following that. Um, also in um, review, some reviews of um, economic reviews and things. So um, the idea that, well, you're always going to need creatives. Well, this, this is here now. It's not the greatest yet, but we've stepped into it. Um, this was um, painted by Aaron. Aaron is a, um, a computer. Now, Aaron needed to be programmed with some brush strokes, and Aaron needed to be programmed with color. And once the brush strokes and the color and the textures were implemented, Aaron could choose to arrange it and draw and paint different um, kinds of paintings. All original, never repeated. Um, so this is from your website. Our intent is for the competencies to serve as a living tool to guide educator development so that a growing number of teachers are able to help scale the transformation to personalized student-centered teaching. So I'm still, I love that by the way. I think that's like a very super goal that you have with your competencies. And I think that my showing you of all these things, the question is still going to be for us, it's not what, but why are we doing this? If we always said we're teaching for jobs, if that's our reason for having education, then we're going to have to come up with a better reason. Because it could be in the future that far fewer us, of us are having jobs than we thought. And if we're not having jobs, the question is, well, what are we doing and how are we making money? Now, I'm not here to answer the how are we making money question. I'm here to question and bring a positive look at what are we doing? Because I actually believe that all of these things are not doom and gloom. I think they're really positive opportunity for us to live and up to our full potential. Because here's what I believe. I believe that we are all born with a gift inside of us. Like, I believe we actually come to the world with purpose. And that our goal as educators and parents and as individuals is to find out what that purpose is and to unwrap that purpose. And that purpose is not necessarily to do a certain um, career. So if you believe this fundamentally, that we have a purpose, this is not going to change because uh, we've developed robots to do tasks for us or jobs. This stays the same, and we have to believe that. Because if we don't believe that, then technology, everything we're doing, is, is anti-humanity. It's leading to our destruction. But I don't believe that, and I didn't come to the world to spread that message. I came with a message of hope, because I believe still that we're given the gift of that intelligence to create beyond so that we have more ability to discover what our true purpose is. And that purpose is going to change, and maybe not be clouded by the fact that we, our economy is the reason why we're educating, or to win the future is why we're educating. So I set out after many years of watching schools and, and, and judging, really, and evaluating what I thought was not happening well for kids. And um, I wrote a book called Your Child's Strengths because it seemed to me that there was some simple things that we were missing in education. It seemed to me that what we were focusing on was what kids couldn't do rather than what they could do. 
It seemed to me that we were concerned more about remediation than we were about exhilaration in learning. And that made me really uncomfortable. And the thing that was the most telling to me was when computers showed up. And I just was fascinated by how kids got down and sucked into and sat on those computers and you just had to drag them off. And my conversations, I was a teacher at the time, and my conversations were around, what are we gonna do to get them off those computers? Can't bring the computers around. And my response was, what are we gonna do to actualize and build on having these computers in the room? Because we want these kids engaged like this all the time. So um, I started what I would call the strengths movement in schools. Um, I decided that I was going to uh, not just have this idea to myself, I was gonna try to spread as far and wide as possible the idea that um, there are strengths. And strengths aren't what you're good at. Strengths are what energize you. So people can have a lot of talent and not be energized. Everyone knows someone who took piano lessons as a kid, and the minute they were told they could stop, and they were quite good at the piano lesson, and the minute they were told they could stop playing the piano, they quit, because it, they didn't get energized by it. You know, the number one job that people report, um, the, uh, the highest suicide rate among professionals happens in two, well, there's two professions that boast of a high suicide rate. One is dentistry, and the other is attorneys. And the reason I think is because we're taught that if you're good at it, you should do it. And especially if, you should, you can, if you're good at it and you can make a lot of money, you should do it. So we get people doing things that they're good at and they're making sufficient income, but they're actually being drained. So a weakness to me is the opposite of a strength. It's a feeling of depletion. So you can be depleted by something that you're talented at. Parents don't like that. That does not fit in with the success gap. However, if strengths are what energize you, it doesn't always mean that you have talent in it. We know what that's called. It's American Idol. All, all those kids are energized by performance, but they're not all talented at it. And, and we sort of even make a pastime at looking at that. But here's the idea. If you're energized by something, if you love something that you're doing, if it puts you in the flow, and you've all been in that place where you are you know, just so captivated by what you're doing that time goes by, then you're gonna spend more time doing that. And the more time you spend doing something that you're in the flow with, the better, ostensibly, you're going to get at it. Versus, the more time you spend doing something that is um, a weakness of yours that depletes you, the more drained you're going to feel. So our goal as educators would be to help people find those activities that put them in the flow and help them figure out how to apply that to the learning that they're in. Let me give you an example. Because people always think that strengths mean talents, like that's what you're good at. And it's not also necessarily a passion, right? I think passion is a word that uh, we use so that you can understand it, mostly because strengths is a hard word in your mouth. It, it's hard to get out. It's, it likes to stay in and move around in there rather than come out. And so passion, we can key on that a little bit easier. But the reason I like the word strength is because we're talking about something that is going to actually, when you do it, strengthen you, give you more energy, make you feel like you're doing what you are meant to do. So we have these subjects, and this is where we talk about strengths in a way that I don't feel is necessarily accurate. So we have, what's your strength? Math, science, reading. Well, we teach this thing called writing. Writing is a generalized interest. In writing, we are able to do three different kinds of things. One is to generate content, right? We generate ideas, so we have to come up with those ideas. The second thing is that we edit. What editing is, is it's, it's a big organizational activity. You take big chunks of information and you move them around to, to make it sound, seem better. Organizing is different than generating ideas, which is different than proofreading, which is really about cleaning up details. 
Now, each one of those things in and of themselves can be applied to other places. So for me, I particularly like organizing. So I get the same thrill out of editing somebody's writing as I do out of organizing my closet. Now, I know that sounds like kind of a silly example. However, I'm trying to give you a simple thing to hold on to to let you know that it's that act of organizing that energizes me that I can then apply to many different situations. So if I get into a meeting at school and we have to have an event and somebody's got to be a greeter and somebody's got to organize the um, the day and somebody's got to do uh, a, a cleanup or something, I'm going to pick the place where I feel the most energized because I'm going to do the best job at that. I'm not good at being a greeter. I'm not, um, I'm, I'm very introverted and, and I'm very in my head a lot. So I would like more to organize and be better at that than putting me in a position where I don't like. So that's what we're going to try to do with students in a very, uh, in a larger way is find places for them to apply their strength. So this quote by Mozart, I am not thoughtless, but am prepared for anything, and as a result can wait patiently for whatever the future holds in store, and I'll be able to endure it. Our kids who we're teaching, if we can tell them where they're strong, where they're energized, where their contribution is, no matter what it is, they won't only be able to endure the future, they'll be able to thrive in the future. So, I think that this thought, which you see, while STEM workers are going to play a key role in a sustained growth and stability of the U.S. economy and are a cr critical component to helping the U.S. win the future. Again, to kids, they don't care what that is, sounds like. That doesn't speak to them. We should not put our economy on the backs of their education. We should look for what energizes them, and then we should help them figure out why they're going to school. Because this is what it, they feel like when we don't make it real for them. And this is what you get in the classroom, because kids don't have a sense of purpose. We have failed to ask this and answer this question for them. Oops. We failed to answer the why question for them. See, the problem with STEM, though, is that we are reinforcing the content, as I said before, rather than the reason that we're using the content. So why? I believe that personalized learning and education begins here. I believe that parents come to me all the time and they ask, well, what, how do kids get, how do, um, how do I, what do I want for my kid? And mostly they say they want them to be happy. Well, happiness is, is, is not a constant state of being. So if we are people who are coming to the world with purpose, if we are purposeful uh, lives, then we are looking for meaningful work, not a career, not a job necessarily, but something that we're doing that's meaningful, and meaningful relationships. And I think meaningful relationships coupled with meaningful work make for meaningful lives, lives of purpose. That should be where we begin education. Not with the economy, not with getting them into college. All of that is just a linear line. It doesn't lead to a future that we even know of. So what, what I love is that then I read on your web page this. Um, Nothing is sacred except the promise of the child. So I went around a lot in um, speaking about strengths. I have like a whole our presentation where I get into the details of it and everything and people used to at the end of it sort of look at me and ask these questions um, how do we do that in a traditional school and you know I always would get the question and finally I reached this fork in the road where I decided that I had to answer honestly and the answer was we can't and at that point, I knew I needed to stop going around and speaking. I need to stop uh, meeting with people and telling them how to teach strengths if they worked in systems that were not able to implement what I had spoken about. Because what I'm speaking about with developing strengths is not necessarily you know, just getting kids interested in doing the content differently. It's really about changing up everything for how we're teaching them. 
So when you sit down and look at kids, the, we have student A learning in the siloed content areas. Most of your schools are probably set up this way. But then we have student B need, needing to do these things with content mastery, critical thinking, problem solving, communication. And what uh, teachers have been able to do is sort of take student B and overlay it back onto student A. And student C is, wow, we have all of these other things, 21st century skills that we want to incorporate. And by the time we get to student C, what I recommend is that student A has used up all the time of the day. So we have to think about time in schools really differently. If we think about time in schools differently, and we think about subject differently, and we think, start thinking about everything differently in school, the next question is, well, what are we going to do then? And that's where we become fear-based. And we can have a lot of different uh, uh, responses. And we can say, well, they have to do this, this, and this. And I will push back and say, they don't have to do anything you think they have to do. Let's question it all. And that's what's going to happen if you start to do change in your schools and in your classrooms, you're going to start to feel really uncomfortable. I sat in a meeting um, yesterday in developing a high school, and I at one point said to the, peop uh, to the people I was working with, I feel like my brain is going to explode, and I'll tell you what, I don't want to keep going through this because I don't have this answer. And if I had the answer for how we're going to do it with the schedule and with, with everything, then you know everyone would do it, but I don't have it, and I feel so much pressure trying to figure it out. So you've got to get out of your comfort zone. And then when you try things, you've got to go out on what I call the rowdy edge. So if you're an educator and you're not out on the rowdy edge, you're not doing change. If you're sitting there being comfortable and just testing things out, you aren't actually doing anything that's fully going to transform anybody. The rowdy edge is a place where time has already gone over the cliff where our ideas of what the future needs to have have gone over the cliff, where what college is about have gone over the cliff, and we're standing there and we got to come up with something so we don't go over the cliff. And if you're there, if you're uncomfortable, if this stuff makes you feel like I don't know what to do, if it challenges your profession, if it challenges your sense of purpose about being a teacher, then you are in the right place. So, one day, I decided I'm going to give up because I couldn't find an environment or a school where what I'm saying could be actualized. So just about the time I gave up, I got a call. Um, the call came from a, um, a consultant who I'd known for many years. And he said, hey, we got a school out in rural Arkansas. Um, they're, they're, they don't have anything yet. You can do whatever you want. And I said, rural Arkansas, where, where? And they said, near Memphis, there's about 900 people in the town. And um, I, I said, I don't know about going to rural Memphis with 900 people. And they said, just come out. Um, and so I went out. And I met with some people. Um, one of them happened to be, his name's Galen Lawrence, and he happens to be a, a multi-billionaire. He's like the Walton family, you know? It's like, here's the biggest, fattest check you could ever have, and what would you do with it if you could do anything in the world? And I said to him, um, Thank, I like the check, let's put it over here, but let's really talk about me doing anything I want. Because that's, that's not going to take money, it's going to take your buy-in first, not your check. Um, the check, by the way, didn't, never has gone into my salary or my pocket, but it certainly has gone into the school. The man, what he did was, there's a town, and the town's called Wilson. It, um, it, is, it used to be a company town, so he bought 80 miles of cotton farm, and 80 contiguous miles within it had a small crumbling town in the delta, right near the Mississippi River. And in, he said first said he did not want to have this town. He didn't know what to do with it. And then during the deal, his father died. And suddenly his own significance, his own purpose was challenged. And he decided he wanted to do something with his life more than just make money. He wanted to make a difference. And so he decided he wanted to revitalize this town. And the first thing you need if you're going to revitalize a town is a school. So he then asked me to come and tell them what I would do. So I went through 
everything I knew about school and everything I'd heard, and this is what I always hear from kids, and I wanted to make a school that wasn't going to waste time, that wasn't going to do things the same. So we just built a clock tower. Um, they, so we, I've had lots of struggle and pushback, and, and, and everything I've wanted to do has been implemented. But there was a clock tower, and they wanted to have this big clock. And I said, I don't think a clock as the beacon of our school is a good metaphor, because the clock is the thing that really strangles us. And they said, well, what would you put up there then? And, and so I responded and said, I would like, you know in a grandfather clock, how they have those little moon phases that go around inside? Have you ever seen it, that? So I asked if we could just have like a big moon phase clock, since we're in an agrarian culture and it's, the time's looking at differently. And could we see that every day and figure out how we were um, doing according to that? And so they liked that idea. And they said yes to that idea. So that's, that's a, a place where I started. Um, so, you know, in, in education, and some of you might know this story, there's a principal, and the principal asks the kids, or asks the teachers to do something different this year, like get involved, do, some, do something that will be um, hands-on. And so there were two teachers, social studies teachers, and the one social studies teacher decided that they would create a unit where the kids, they brought in voting booths, the kids were the, going to run for president, they were going to um, have, a, have a voting contest and the uh, debates and the whole deal that went with it. And then the other class was going to learn about what it took to vote and what it took to get people to register to vote. And, and their task was going to be go out and get people really registered to vote and get them to vote. So in the end, the um, one class with the voting booths had a typical bell curve. Small, um, a number of kids aced it, did great, were engaged. A number of kids just sort of did it and got it done. And a number of kids failed, didn't show up for school, just refused to participate. And in the second class, all the kids did well. Like, we're all energized, all involved in it, all feeling as though it, it, um, it was a success. And when the kids were asked, what's the difference between these two projects, because they were both hands-on and they were both learning, the kids said in the project where they went out and got voters to sign up that it was real. And I think that's a really important first stop, step Kids, like adults, want work that's real. They want it to be authentic. And when it is authentic, then it becomes, for them, more engaging. Then they're all able to find where the strength is and how it's applied. So this is uh, what comes on the, um, the biology in a box. Here's the box. And um, <laughs> I have to keep going back to the biology in a box. because. Well, the kids might be doing, might, while you might use tools to do exciting activities, they're not actually doing real work when they're doing some of these kids. So what is real work? And how do we get kids engaged? And what's going to be important for the future? So I think the world will always have problems. Lots of problems. Exciting problems, hard problems, painful problems, interesting problems. Enough problems for everybody all of us and all the kids coming up to get engaged and involved and have a contribution to get to make in helping to solve these problems. To me, that's the how. That's where you begin the how. And so what we've done at the Delta School is take projects and say they have to be real. Kids have to do real work. And they have to, um, because project-based learning, just doing projects can be as flat and as content-driven as anything. But unless you're actually solving a problem and doing something you care about and engaging, then you're, you're not going to get the kids buy-in 100%. So we've taken project-based learning and added to it human-centered design process. Um, which I can talk to any of you about later. There's plenty to learn about it. But it takes the Stanford design process where you empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And it, um, it lends itself to, uh, to the problems that kids come up with. So ch children pick projects that they feel are important to them in their lives, and they solve them using this process. Now, this process isn't linear. 
It, it looks like this. We think this is what it looks like. And in equal time, we're going to empathize first, then we're going to define, then we're going to ideate. But it's not. It, it really looks more like this. This is, to me, the rowdy edge in the classroom. It's messy. It's scary. We don't know what it is. But we see, after doing it a lot, that there is total beauty in the struggle. There's wonder in failing forward. The struggle, the hard part, the trying to figure it out, that's where the learning happens. But that's where we as educators want to push away from. It's easier with the box. It's easier with biology in a box because there's a recipe. So human-centered learning around project design actually takes away some of the, um, the, the ease. The question that we ask to all projects are, are they feasible? Are they viable? And are they desirable to kid, to, to who you're making the project for? So something might be desirable to me as the teacher, but if I'm solving a problem, my solution might not be desirable to the people who are going to be the users. And then is it feasible? This is where kids fall down in projects a lot. I had kids just recently say, we're going to bring a cow to campus, and then we're going to milk it and make ice cream, and then we're going to open an ice cream store. And I said, and when are you going to do that? And they said, well, we'll probably do that in the, in the project period, which lasts six weeks. And so I didn't have to say no. I just put up the, this uh, model and asked them, is this really feasible? Is it, is it viable? Can you do this? And, and they were quick to say no. So you know, it's easy to get them to off of an idea and onto a better idea that works. See. Adding curriculum, doing something differently, like I'm talking about, isn't about implementing one more thing. Like, now we've got to do project-based learning. It's about embedding the real world into your classroom. And I still think you need the classroom, because there has to be this collaboration. Because if you go back to my first slide, where everyone was up here trying to solve this problem, that's what you need to, to, to really work on something to have a breakthrough. You need to be with people. So what are some of the things we work on? Um, we start with the question, how might we? How might we get kids to stop being afraid of bees? We have a garden at our school, and we noticed one day a swarm came over. And half the kids were very fascinated by it, and some of the kids were really scared of the bees. And then we decided that we wanted the bees. We want to keep the bees. There was a group of kids who want the bees on campus. They want to take care of them. They want to produce honey. They want to have them. And the problem was that some of the kids were afraid of bees, so the project was going to develop around how might we stop younger kids from being afraid of bees. What that did was it opened up to a lively project where they ended up bringing in an author. The author was a nature photographer. They ended up writing a book about, a, ch a kid's book, about all of the wonderful things bees do and why you shouldn't be afraid of them. And they, they made several books along those lines. So they learned about storytelling. They learned about books. They learned about the science of bees. They put the book together. They uh, presented the book to kids. And it has a real purpose at the school. And they were engaged in that project. And they don't want to stop. And they want to keep it going. Um, another thing, we're on a big fault line, the biggest fault line in the, in the country, and with the potential to have probably the biggest earthquake in the country down on the Mississippi River. And um, yet, we don't talk about it. And so the kids said, how are, is the town prepared for a natural disaster? So this involved going out and interviewing townspeople and asking them what they knew about earthquakes, what, they, what, they, what if one came, what they do, what they needed from us as a school to survive in this. And this resulted in many different kinds of solutions, but an understanding and a real, a real understanding of what was going on. So they, the kids made it real, and they, they learned a ton of back knowledge that all had something to do with what they were learning about. So they learned about disasters. They learned about relief. They learned about possibilities of what happens when, um, you know, what is, what is an earthquake? Um, we live, although we're in an agricultural community, in one of the most unhealthy counties in the country. Uh, people do not eat healthy. They don't, um, and, and because of that, our um, insurance prices are high. Our, um, our care is not, not great. Um, and so the kids, because we have this garden and we take a lot of there, they want to figure out how to get local people to eat more healthy because they knew that would help the, our community. So again, the project that built around this, you can imagine all of the different things that come into play in solving this problem. 
Um, there's a garden, a community garden. There were goats in the garden. The goats were fighting with each other. And so we were going to have to get rid of the goats. And the kids love the goats, so they didn't want to get rid of them. So we, the question was, how might we stop the goats in the garden from fighting each other? And here was the great thing that the kids came up with. So we have, a, we call our playground the wonder space. It's where kids play for over an hour a day and it's this huge you know, thing. And they said, we don't fight in the wonder space. We don't have conflict. We have a lot of conflict outside the wonder space. So a kid said, we need to have a wonder space for the goats, which sounds kind of crazy, but I'll show you later because they did it and it was really cool. Um, so the how might we questions, they have to be authentic and real, not opening the ice cream shop in six weeks. Okay, that's not going to be real. They must solve a real human problem or a real animal problem or a real problem. Um, because when you just play school, kids get disengaged real quickly. When you just make up stuff, like we're going to write, uh, they were doing this last night and I got on the phone and I said, I just left for 24 hours and you're already back in the fantasy world. They, um, they're writing letters to celebrities to ask them to come and do something at the school. And they listed the celebrities. And I said, so when are the celebrities going to come? And they told me, oh, in two weeks. And I said, that right there is not real. So make it real. And, you know, otherwise, they're, they're, the quality of their letters, when they know in the back of their head that that guy's not, definitely not coming to the school in two weeks, the quality of that letter goes way down, and their buy-in goes way down. The more real it is, the more heightened it is. So, and it must demand many possible solutions. And as teachers, you must be willing to let your class find those solutions and steer them to the solutions. So our kids start in the phase of ideation. You can see in the background there, there's lots of ideas that brainstorm. Some of those get picked, some of those don't. The next thing they do, even our youngest, our four-year-olds, our five-year-olds, they start to prototype and they do building. Everything from making a small prototype to a rapid prototype. A rapid prototype would just be drawing pictures. Our five-year-olds get up and do presentations of learning of problems they solved and you can ask them lots of questions and they will answer them with, with great intensity because they're so bought in. Um, this girl, the, the, the question with this problem was um, how are we going to get along in our classroom because they were starting to fight and so she decided that they needed a game that was going to help them. And so she decided, we tried to get her to make the game on online game but she really wanted a physical game. So um, here was her prototype next to um, you know, they, how, how it would be packaged and everything. The game had, in its various stages of the prototyping, so it started with, you know, first it's going to be the, um, the thing in the middle where it's just, um, oops, does this work? Oops. Oh, now I've done it. Uh, the thing in the middle where it's just cut out and then she's got the showing where the lights are going to be and then in the box it's painted up with the lights on it. She's going to take that next. This would be uh, the prototype. It's Light Me Up Friends was the game she, she developed. Now she really thought this idea was a great idea so um, she thought people would really want it and buy it. So we brought in some in investors to work with us to talk to, to about um, the viability of actually selling this. And they were real and they were honest with her and told her the capital she had to raise and all of all these things. And um, so we, we kept taking it to be a reality. Remember the goats? So here's their prototypes of the goat uh, wonder space. They would be able to play on this so they wouldn't be butting up around each other. And here's the prototype held against what they started to actually build at the school. Um, they tested it with my dog before they brought the goats on board. And then they actually set it up and it's over at the farm and they made it and the goats play on it all the time. So they get to see that success and every time they drive by it they're like, we made that! You know, they're really into it. Um, they wanted to make these vertical gardens. 
They do these presentations, they go out, they wanted to put a little library in to town. We said, well, you can't just put a little library in, you've got to go through the process of the state of the town council. They had to learn about what the town council was, they had to figure out how decisions are made through the town council, they made a presentation and they gave it to the town council, the town council considered it, they gave them space to put the little library up and they did it and now it's their little library right in the town square that they have to take care of and have an ongoing report back to the town every month to tell them you know if it's working or not and how they're assessing it but they're really into it um, so our kids at all ages engage in projects the prototyping process has them using all kinds of technology the problems that they come up with have multiple kinds of solutions that we go with and their strengths then are engaged you don't need a billionaire to do this you need to have the courage to be able to think differently and let things go. So when people say, well, when are they doing, uh, in, we're, we're just now planning to move on to the high school, when are they doing high school ke chemistry? My answer is they're not gonna do that like you did it. And it takes great courage to say that because it's not gonna matter. Um, but they're gonna learn chemistry and they're gonna apply chemistry. So I really think that the future does hold great things for kids. I really think that as educators, we've got to be able to get to the place where we're hanging out on the rowdy edge for a while and feeling uncomfortable, and that engaging kids' strengths is going to take involving them in real work. And once they're able to do that, it doesn't matter what happens in the future. They'll be ready, and they'll be equipped, and they'll be acting in a way that is um, finding out what their purpose is, because I do believe it's a magical world. And so I hope that you will go exploring a little bit more as well. That's it.